So I brought the two cell phones today. <laughs> so this is my regular phone, and it's the kind of a phone you have in your pockets also. You know very well what it does and what it does not. This is the uh, first cell phone uh, from the 80s, 35 years ago. Uh, everything is big around it. Uh, big battery, big antenna, big uh, handheld. Uh, so, <coughs> you know, in basically any way, this phone is better. Except for one thing. This phone has one feature that is outperforms this one. And that is, uh, it has a much stronger signal. Much stronger than the phone we have in our pockets today. This phone can reach much further than our the phones we have today. And that is, of course, <coughs> very good to have this, this kind of feature here in the, uh, in the region where we are now. Uh, so it appears that for every generation, first generation, fourth generation, for every generation, the phone has become better in many ways, except one, coverage, signal range. And uh, that's, of course, that's a problem. And uh, so it, uh, that is, uh, the question is, how do you deal with that? The operators in the cities, they deal with that by building more base stations. For every network, more and more base stations are built, and uh, that you can do in the cities. Here, it's too expensive. It's too expensive to, to build, clo uh, to cover basically the, uh, the, uh, the area here. Uh, and the same goes, unfortunately, also for, the, uh, for fixed uh, connections, fiber connections and uh, uh, telephones. It's very expensive to dig fiber into the ground the further you the further you, you live from urbanization. And uh, uh, so it appears that whenever you go here, we have good connection here on the, uh, on the, on the hotel, but whenever, w as soon as we leave here the area, and we move into the smaller roads, the forest, and the people in the here in the audience, you know very well that this is so, you will lose connection. It appears there is a line, an invisible line in the forest, that when you cross it, you lose connection, both from the fixed, uh, uh, connections and from the wireless connections. And that is a, a big problem, of course, for all the, the stakeholders here. You have b large values here, forestry, tourism, you have uh, the healthcare, but the most of, most of the important thing is the, uh, the people who live here. Uh, when people beyond the line do not have coverage, do not have a good connection, and the people within the line do, then you get a problem and it becomes, in the end, a democratic problem. Uh, so the question is, what can you do about it? Can we do anything about that uh, when it's too expensive to build base stations, too expensive to dig fiber? Uh, so we started a project uh, earlier this, this summer uh, with the ambition, basically, to give to this phone the coverage of that phone. And in a sense, even more ambition. We want to, as a first step, make sure that we cover Sweden, the north of Sweden, the region, completely. That we g give connectivity to all places in Sweden. And we are very happy that that project, uh, full coverage, uh, to have as, as, as the ambassador of that project, Vint Cerf. And uh, Vint Cerf, I think, is, uh, is with us here. Uh, Vint is the... Um, Vint, can you, can you hear us? There. Can you hear me now? Yes. We can yeah. hear you. We Good cannot dog. see you yet. <laughs> <laughs> we cannot see you, though, Vint, yet. Uh, oh, well, I have the video turned on, uh, so I don't know why you're not seeing me. Okay. Uh, I'm not sure what to tell you about that. Uh, I, so my video is, uh, is showing that it, the camera is on. Okay, we'll do our best here. We did see you a, wi uh, a while ago. Oh really? Yes. So we, I don't know when we, when we why. let's see. If when we established the call, I, we did see you. But I was talking about connectivity here in the region. Yes. yes. Uh, did you did you hear my introduction so far? Yes, I did, and Good. I was going to tell you that uh, the phone you were describing, we used to call the Motorola Brick because it weighed about two and a half pounds. Yes, it does. And, That's why I put it on the ground here. It, it, yeah, exactly. And so when I talked to the inventor of that, Marty Cooper, uh, I asked him how long did the battery last, and he said uh, about 20 minutes. 
And I said, that seems rather short. And he said, no, it's okay. You can't hold the phone up that long anyway. <laughs> that's, that's so true. Uh, I was, we're working here on the, on the connection, Vint. I was just uh, introducing you. Uh, let me complete that before I hand over. Uh, Vint, Surf, Vint Surf is the vice president now of Google. He's, w he's known by m many as the, one of the fathers of the internet. And uh, he is also with Google now as a chief internet evangelist, if I say it correctly. And uh, yes. so we're very happy to have him as the, as the ambassador of our, of our uh, project. And uh, so my introduction was kind of uh, a bit pessimistic, Vint, about, co uh, about uh, uh, connecting the regions and the rural, the rural regions. Uh, do you agree that this is a concern and to what extent is the concern or is there hope? It's an enormous concern, and uh, of course, my job as internet evangelist is to connect everything and every everyone uh, into this common and global internet. And we're far from that. Literally, uh, today, uh, the ITU reports that about 50 percent of the world's population has uh, become connected to the internet. We have another uh, 3.8 or so billion people still to connect, especially as we go to the far north and the far south uh, or out into the middle of the Pacific, for example. Uh, but there are new technologies coming that will help. Uh, your own work on amplifying the signal for LTE or for the mobile uh, is hugely helpful. Uh, I'm going to interrupt for one second and tell you that I am getting every once in a while a, an error message from Skype saying server connection has been successfully restored. So that suggests that the server is cutting in and out. Are you still getting audio okay? Yes, we hear you loud and clear. Okay, so I don't know what to tell you about the, uh, the video. I'm in a hotel where there is a pretty good uh, bandwidth. But anyway, th let's just keep going and perhaps uh, it will restore itself. Yes. Uh, so anyway, there's a lot of work going on trying to improve connectivity where it doesn't exist. And one of the most dramatic uh, proposals comes from Elon Musk, the, uh, uh, the founder of SpaceX, uh, the uh, rocket company. Uh, he's now got permission to launch about 11,000 satellites into orbit, uh, polar orbit, uh, in order to achieve full global coverage. And that's pretty exciting. Uh, now, whether it, it, that system will work uh, is not so clear, but uh, it would certainly produce a substantial increase in connectivity in places where it doesn't exist. These satellites would be in orbit around uh, 1,100 kilometers, possibly another layer, a lower layer, 7,000 at 1,143 kilometers, and another uh, 4,000 or so at lower uh, altitude, uh, perhaps uh, 800 or 900 kilometers. So the uh, latency would be quite low. Uh, we have some worked examples of satellite connectivity that um, are worthy of attention. One is from a company called O3B, or Other 3 Billion. Uh, the satellites they put up are in equatorial orbit, but they are only at 8,000 kilometers. So uh, the, each of the satellites has a 10-spot beam capability, each beam up to 1 gigabit per second. So the, the capacity of the satellite is 10 gigabits per second in aggregate, and as they are uh, uh, as they're flying around in orbit, they can switch the beam uh, to 10 different possible locations. There's a third uh, effort, which has just recently uh, gone into commercial operation. It's from, it's a spin-out uh, from Google. It's called Loon, L-O-O-N, which, uh, which is uh, the name of uh, a bird, and it also means uh, crazy. Uh, these are balloons that are at, uh, in the stratosphere at about 60,000 feet, and they are circulating around the Earth uh, at that altitude. They're, uh, they're free-flying balloons. They are steered by the winds uh, and a very complex routing algorithm. So the balloon goes up and down looking for tailwinds in order to accelerate towards the location of service and then looking for headwinds in order to loiter. Uh, over the service area. Uh, so they're delivering LTE, which uh, can carry IP uh, traffic. And that has gone into uh, commercial operation as of the last couple of weeks. Uh, there's a third project, which you may already have mentioned, uh, that uh, I'm very uh, 
proud of and excited about, and that was an effort to use uh, a delay and disruption tolerant networking protocol, which was designed for interplanetary communication. Uh, it was it was tested uh, by our uh, colleagues, uh, uh, the uh, in uh, the uh, reindeer herders, um, in the northern part of Sweden. And we've run at least two tests where we put these uh, transceivers on the uh, on the uh, reindeer, uh, and we've used store and forward relay in order to maintain connectivity. So those are all three examples or four examples of things that are being done in order to improve uh, connectivity in places that are uh, pretty isolated. What what uh, I, I, when you mean when you mention these these uh, uh, examples, does Google or do you have any horizon, a time, uh, you know, projection when these these innovations can come to the benefits of, of all the people in the in the rural? Well, first of all, uh, the the experiments with the uh, delay and disruption tolerant protocols uh, uh, already arrived, but they're not. It's not being commercially deployed. So, uh, and I don't know that there's a current plan to do that. The O3B satellite system is already in orbit, but it cannot reach the northern parts uh, of the world because of the equatorial orbit. Uh, with regard to Elon Musk's projects. Uh, I would guess that he's three to five years away from being able to launch uh, satellites. He's already put up at least two test satellites, as I understand it. Uh, so he's certainly on the edge of being able to do something. Uh, but I think that we still have to hold our breath for a few more years uh, to see whether or not uh, his, uh, he's capable of uh, making a business model that works. Uh, but I'm very hopeful because he's been quite successful both with the rockets that he's built and with the cars, the Tesla cars that he makes. Uh, and I have two of those, and I can tell you that they work very well, and we're very happy with them. <laughs> okay. Uh, what about uh, uh, the, uh, the terrestrial-based systems? Or, or does Google have any, any ideas of what, uh, what terrestrial systems can, you know, can improve or can, can do? To the to yeah. new connectivity, for instance, in the states, yeah. but also elsewhere. Yes. Well, I can tell you that uh, about eight years ago, I think uh, Google began to explore uh, installing fiber uh, in cities in the United States uh, in order to uh, deliver high-speed internet service. We started with Kansas City uh, across both sides of the river in Missouri and Kansas. Uh, we also uh, uh, did some work in Palo Alto, which is in the near uh, Mountain View where the headquarters is. Uh, what we discovered rather quickly is that digging up the streets and putting in fiber is pretty expensive, uh, or uh, putting fiber on telephone poles uh, is expensive because if you don't own the poles, the people who do will charge you a lot uh, to connect to them. Uh, so we moved from that to uh, using existing fiber and then extending the fiber using microwave links. Uh, so uh, that effort uh, has proceeded, and we've done some work in, um, uh, in India, for example. Uh, about 400 railroad stations have been uh, connected to the Internet, and they're uh, delivering Wi-Fi service, so people in railroad stations can have very good access to the Internet. We've seen teachers bring their students uh, to the railroad stations to do their homework. Uh, we've also uh, built some fiber networks in cities uh, in Africa, for example, in uh, Kampala, Uganda, uh, and in Ghana. Uh, we have built an optical fiber network as a wholesale service, which we then sell uh, to retailers who offer Internet access to customers. Uh, that service went well enough that uh, we have turned the uh, business over to a joint venture called, uh, oh, I forget the exact name, but uh, it's, it's, a, uh, it's a consortium of two or three companies, including Google, that, uh, that offer uh, this wholesale service. Uh, we've not done anything uh, in isolated areas like uh, the northern part of, uh, of Sweden, however. Uh, this other thing, which I have uh, underwritten uh, in small amounts, 
uh, is service to the areas in the U.S. which are very, very poorly connected, and particularly the Native American reservations. So we have worked with some of the Native American uh, companies that are trying to uh, build up Internet, uh, Wi-Fi, and, uh, and LTE service uh, in, in the reservations. And uh, for those cases, uh, we've been uh, helping uh, fund uh, installations of uh, radio transceivers uh, and uh, solar power uh, in order to maintain continuous operation. Uh, so the topography uh, makes a big difference. Depending on uh, where the reservation happens to be, for instance, if it has mountains surrounding, then putting repeaters uh, at the, you know, up at high altitude in order to get good coverage uh, has worked out pretty well. Uh, but that's still just uh, the very beginning of things that can be done. So I'm sorry, the mixture of, of uh, fiber reaching as far as it is affordable mm -hmm. and then uh, projection of connectivity through radio uh, is a very attractive possibility. Oh. Okay, so you would say very shortly as a last comment, would you say, I was mentioning the, the concerns about for, for the rurality and the di a digital divide, would you say that there is some hope that we can close that divide? I, I believe so. Uh, one thing I will say is that in addition to physical challenges of distance, which you correctly uh, characterized, uh, we also have a problem with regard to disposable income in populations that are living in uh, relatively isolated areas. Those are often in countries with very low GDP. And what that means is that making the system sustainable and affordable means driving costs out. So it means we have to make less, exp less expensive physical equipment. Uh, we have to find inexpensive ways of achieving connectivity. Uh, and some of that, of course, will turn out to be uh, high-frequency radio operating up uh, in the 70 to 80 gigahertz band. To give you an example of that, in the case of the balloon project, the balloon project, the, um, we're actually connecting from the balloon to the ground at 75 gigahertz. That's a very high frequency. The good news there, of course, is that you can have a very broad band signal, 5 gigahertz signal, uh, to the ground. Uh, in the far north, uh, those frequencies can often be um, uh, weak because of uh, attenuation from uh, precipitation uh, or fog or things like that. So um, I think there, there has to be some uh, serious uh, testing to make sure that uh, those kinds of frequencies will work. But I certainly believe that, uh, that we'll see successful deployment of uh, satellite-based systems uh, in that far north. Whether we could deploy a balloon that far north, I'm not so sure. It depends a lot on the wind conditions, for example, and whether we can actually control the balloons uh, at that altitude and at that uh, latitude. Okay. Vin, thank you mu very much for being with us. I know you have uh, it's early morning in California. It's, uh, I guess you have nice temperatures there. Uh, thank you. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, you know, very thank much you. for yes. being with it's us. It's very pleasant compared to where you are, and it looks to me like I'm seeing the midnight sun or something uh, low on the horizon where you are. Yes, the sun is gone now, but uh, it's, it's, we have a beautiful lay here. Thank you once again. Uh, thank you very uh, much for being with so us. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank Talk you. Talk to Mirkit. <laughs>